welcome again and thank you for joining PMC and thank you to the Northland Library for hosting us with Judge Oscar Petit. We are going to discuss landlord tenant disputes. So, um, hmm, why can't, okay, there. PMC is uh, an organization that was established over 30 years ago to fight for fair courts in Pennsylvania. We are, uh, we were established as a result of a, I would like to say, a crisis in confidence in the judiciary. And we wanted to make sure that, you know, we, we were created to, to help with the, to try to change the way Pennsylvanians select their judges. Right now in Pennsylvania, we elect our judges. 35 years ago, PMC was established to, to support it's called a judicial selection entitled merit selection. It hasn't happened in 30 years. So instead, we, PMC has pivoted a little bit. And what we do is we want to make sure that we educate the public about the court system. Court system has a tremendous impact on your everyday life and you will vote for judges. So it's important for you to understand what judges do, what the courts do and their impact. So, uh, you know, again, we are here for to answer any questions, we have a hotline, uh, we have pro various programs, so please feel free to reach out to us. Um, okay, we, what we do, we, we do a lot, okay? We do advocacy, we, 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 have, uh, we focus on judicial selection, we focus on judicial dis discipline, we do bail hearings uh, watches. So in Pittsburgh and in Philadelphia, we have, we have a bail review, uh, program where we have we train individuals to go into arraignments, preliminary arraignments, and make observations. And we will be compiling a report sometime this summer about the findings that individuals have found. We do a lot of civic education, including this program. We have uh, programs next week as well about family law. Uh, we do just a court basics program. We also have a one-day law school for journalists, which will be this summer in July to educate journalists you know, in, with respect to the courts so that their coverage is, is fair, accurate, and not misleading. And here are our upcoming programs. Uh, there, if you have, is there, a, a, are there any um, pamphlets at the Northland Library, Michelle, or we can, we can, we can, we can um, send out in the PDF of this PowerPoint after the program so you have this information. This coming week, we will actually be in Pittsburgh or the beginning next week because we have our spring benefit where, we'll be, where we will be presenting the Judge Justin Johnson Award to Judge Brooke Smith. We will have Judge Kim Berkeley Clark be our keynote speaker. She is an amazing judge. She is caring, uh, enthusiastic, and really um, has, has led the court in, in the right direction. It's the only thing I can, one thing I can say. So again, we have PMC watches, PMC listens, and PMC shares. So a little primer, quick, a very quick primer about the Pennsylvania judicial system. Our court system is known as a, as you'll see this triangular diagram all over it. And on the pacourts.us is the website for our court system. The highest court in Pennsylvania, which has the final authority with respect to the law in Pennsylvania, is our Pennsylvania Supreme Court. That court takes uh, is, 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 takes appeals, but on a discretionary basis, meaning not every case the courts will hear. It's up to the judges to decide whether they want to hear the case. Below them, the case, the court from which appeals are made are the Commonwealth Court and the Superior Court. That below the Commonwealth Court and the Superior Court is the Court of Common Pleas. Court of Common Pleas is a court where it, it could be, it is known as an entry level court in that if you have a dispute over a matter that's greater than $12,000, you would go to the Court of Common Pleas. Or if you have an appeal from the Magisterial District Court, which is where the landlord tenant disputes fits in, it would be appealed to the Court of Common Pleas. That is a very fast <laughs> summary of our, of our court system. But, um, you know, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court has seven judges that the Commonwealth Court and the Appellate Court have um, uh, 15 and 11 judges. And the Court of Common Pleas in Allegheny County has, has many more judges. I'm not even sure right now how many uh, judges are in our Court of Common Pleas in Allegheny County, because we also include, there are also senior judges who, who assist in adjudicating matters. 
And then there are, uh, um, there are over 500, I'll say, magisterial district court judges in our Commonwealth. And, um, and one, of the, one of the magisterial district judges who is very special to PMC is Judge Petit, who is joining us for our landlord-tenant presentation to you. Okay, so uh, quickly, the Allegheny Court, this is the Allegheny Court of Common Pleas. Again, it, there are 43 Common Pleas Court judges. It handles civil and criminal, judge, uh, criminal trials. And I guess I should have to pay attention. And here's again, the Court of Common Pleas. This is the court administration set up. Judge Clark is the president judge. And then it's divided into divisions, a civil division, a criminal division, a family division, and an orphan's court division. Orphan's court is a little um, misleading in its naming. It's, it, it deals with adoptions, but it also deals with wills um, and, and guardianship. Discuss that. Oh, I didn't realize I had all these slides. I was rushing through it. So here's, this is the pictures of our Commonwealth Court. The Commonwealth Court is the only court like it in, in, in the 50 states of America. Um, the most recent Commonwealth Court judge is, is the judge pictured in the, in the corner. The pictures of the judges are not current on the court's website, but we will hopefully get them current. I've asked them to make it current because this individual right here has been promoted, I will say, to Pennsylvania Supreme Court, he um, he was he was elected in our in our 2021 election. Um, Pennsylvania judges are elected in odd numbered years. This is our Pennsylvania Superior Court, and as you, as I had said, there are 15 judges. But as you see, this bench has more than 15 judges because we you, there are a lot of senior judges who assist in the administration of justice. Judge Megan King is the newest appointee to the Pennsylvania Superior Court. This is our highest court, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, and Judge Robeson, again, is the newest elect elected judge to our, our Pennsylvania Supreme Court. It is the oldest court in the state. It is celebrating its 300th anniversary uh, in two weeks, and it has a, a lot of events across the state. So if you are interested, go on the pacourts.us website and you will see the various events that it is holding to celebrate its 300th anniversary. Okay, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, Art Court also has some supervisory activities. So not only do they hear cases uh, you know, and, and, and adjudicate disputes, but they also have an administrative office in the Pennsylvania courts where they educate judges, they, they are responsible for budgeting of the court system, they are responsible for a judicial conduct board. They have special committees. The Supreme Court has a committee, various rules committees addressing criminal rules, rules of evidence, civil rules, appellate rules. And then they also regulate the practice of law, including attorney admission and discipline. And we are about to begin our landlord tenant presentation. Should Judge Petit, I'm going to pass it off to you. Good afternoon, good evening to everyone who is, um, who's online or who is in person who is participating in this landlord and tenant workshop. Um, thank you to Pennsylvanians for Martyr and Courts for once again having me. I know that this workshop is only an hour, so I will try to get through um, the slideshow as quickly and effectively as I can and hopefully be able to entertain any questions that any of you may have. Um, I'm sitting in my courtroom right now. This is the room where it happens. If you, if you, if you saw Hamilton, you remember they talked about the room where it happens. Um, our powers for magisterial district judges are granted under Title 42, Section 1513 of the Judiciary and Judicial Procedures Code. Um, so we can hear all these cases, but I'm very proud to be a part of Pennsylvania's unified judicial system, as well as our just, just to know that our Pennsylvania Supreme Court is the oldest court in the land. And many other courts have, have patterned their laws after our own Supreme Court. But, but let's get right into it and talk about what are tenants' rights. Uh, federal and Pennsylvania laws tell us that all individuals have rights against discrimination and um, um, particularly as it relates to uh, landlord, tenant, real estate or mortgage worker uh, services or any other form of discrimination as it relates to color, age, religion, national origin, sex, gender, identity, sexual orientation, 
disability or familiar, familial status. Housing discrimination is illegal. And there is recourse under the Department of Housing and Development. Uh, you can call them or with the Pennsylvania Human, Rela Human Relations Commission if you feel that you've ever been discriminated against uh, in, in housing matters. What are some examples of discrimination? Let's suppose you have a landlord that all of a sudden he's, he's, he, he has a, um, a property up for rent, but when you get there, they discover that you have children and they tell you suddenly that they no longer have property up for rent. Or the landlord says that the rent is higher than advertised uh, after, you have a, after meeting with the potential tenant in person. The landlord doesn't, does not allow full use of all home facilities because of race. And we talked about the, the advertising stating that a property is only available to people without children. Oops, Here are some things that a landlord cannot do. Take or sell a tenant's property if they do not pay rent. Shut off utilities or lock a tenant out of the property if they do not pay. This is known as self-help evictions. The court frowns upon self-help evictions. Harass a tenant. And certainly harassment would be up to a court to decide, but what a reasonable person would believe is harassment. Enter the property or allow others to enter the property without giving um, permission. Require a, a deposit for an animal assistance uh, or cancel an existing lease of the tenants if the building is sold to a new landlord. No, Your right Honor, I, I missed this slide. So let me go back a slide, sorry. Okay, what are the tenant's responsibilities? A tenant must make responsibility to pay the rent and to pay it on time. This is very important. We can, we'll talk about that uh, a little later. Uh, most leases that I've seen um, requires that the rent be due on the first of the month and late by the fifth of the month. They must also obey the terms of the lease. If the lease states that the tenant must pay utilities, then the tenant must get the bills from the landlord. Make sure to get a signed copy of the lease to monitor the rules and terms so you can utilize them. Now, there are many, many times when I've seen that the tenant never asked for a signed copy of the lease. That is a big mistake. That is something that you should always do uh, before moving in. Have that copy of, of the lease handy. The, the tenant must communicate with the landlord about repair issues as soon as they occur. It is best to do this in writing and to keep a copy of this notice and the tenant should return the property to the way in, it was when they moved in, minus reasonable wear and tear and removing all belongings. Oftentimes the tenant may feel if they leave the sofa, it's okay. The landlord may charge you to, take, to, to remove that sofa if they have to pay someone to take it out of there. And here's another important caveat. If you paint the walls, because most units are white when you move in and it may be okay if you communicate with the landlord first to change the color if it doesn't fit your decor, but you're gonna to have to change it back to the original color before you move out. If not, the landlord's gonna charge you for repainting the, the unit. You will see throughout this presentation a, a, a theme and the theme is communication is key, right? Make sure that you are talking, you know, make sure that there are communications between the tenant and landlord as to expectations so that there's a clear understanding of who expects what. And oftentimes I see in court when we talk about utility bills, uh, particularly the water bill. Now light bills and gas bills, uh, tenants can get those in their name, but the water bill is different. That runs with the land. That, that means that the tenant doesn't pay it. The, the, the property owner is responsible for paying the water bill. And oftentimes that water bill will come in the property owner's name. Now, there's a form that you can fill out with the water company that will allow you to have a copy of the water bill. If not, you need to request copies of those bills each and every month uh, from, your, from your landlord. Okay, a landlord has rights too. 
A landlord can set rules about how the property and common areas are to be used. They are entitled to have keys to the property. So if the tenant changes the locks, must give the landlord a copy. Sometimes the tenant may add a, um, another lock on the door and the landlord can't get in in case of an emergency. If you add another lock on the door, if you change the locks, you have to give the landlord a key. Landlords have the right to evict the tenant if they do not pay rent or do not pay on time consistently, or if they break or breach agreements in the lease. Now, one thing about a breach of a lease agreement, oftentimes they can be cured. It, 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 it may not be enough to have you evicted, but who wants to go to court and have a judge make a determination um, for you to, to, to stop the behavior that you're doing, whether it's, whether it's uh, loud noise um, or whether it's um, um, your, 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 your children running up and down the hallways or something like that and, and creating a, uh, a problem for people to enjoy their right to quiet, quiet enjoyment. A landlord also must pursue evictions through the court system. You know, it used to be years ago that they would just put your stuff out and lock, and lock you out. They cannot do that anymore. It's also argued if whether or not having a, a roof over your head is a fundamental right. If it's a fundamental right, that means you're entitled to due process of law under the 14th Amendment to the Pennsylvania and the U.S. Constitution. And that says that you're required notice and a hearing. So they have to pro, uh, proceed through the eviction through the court system. They cannot just lock your doors. Landlords may also require security deposits. Um, and landlords are not responsible for a tenant's personal belongings. So I want to just add, you know, the, the judge talked about how you don't want to just go to the, have, have the landlord go to court. Uh, you know, maybe the eviction can be cured. But remember, every time there's a matter in court, it is now a record that is attached to your name that will follow you. So again, you know, if, if you can work something out with the landlord without a lawsuit being filed, that is better for everybody. That is so important to, to, to recognize that, you know, we're in this internet age. Everything can be found out about you if you, particularly if you end up in court. So if you leave one place and you go to another, that new landlord is going to see if whether or not you've ever been brought to court mm -hmm. and what the reason is for. So even if you pay and get the matter resolved, the mere fact that you've been to court, yep. you've established a record and they may be reluctant to rent to you because of that. So these are more, more of a landlord's responsibilities. All right. These are the landlord's responsibilities. And these are just some, but they're, they're, they're very important. Maintain the property in good, safe condition. Safe, sanitary, and accessible as determined by housing codes. Repairs completed in a reasonable time. Um, not required to pay for repair damage caused by the tenant. M a multi-unit building landlord is responsible for maintaining the common areas. To meet safety and cleanliness standards, a, a landlord must provide drinkable water in the kitchen and the bathroom, a functioning bathroom with toilet and shower and tub, safe and functioning electrical system, no chipped or peeling paint, hot water, Heat during cold months, no cool air. Required unless written in the lease. Working sewage system, working smoke alarms. I had a case very recently this week uh, in a uh, high-end apart apartment building downtown where the um, person's tub was not working properly. And they thought it was mold. And so there was a, there was a, a lawsuit from the landlord for non-payment of rent, but the tenant also sued for, for, for not having the right to the peaceful and quiet and enjoyment of the entire unit that they rented because of the tub situation. So these are some of the responsibilities, but they're very important primary responsibilities of, of the landlord. Lead-based paint, that's important. A landlord must inform a tenant of lead-based paint, lead in the pipes in the property before a tenant signs a lease. Landlord can be sued for triple the amount of damages. I've never had a case like that, but it's very important. If the tenant pays the utilities separately from the rent, the landlord must install separate meters. 
If they cannot be metered separately, the landlord must pay the utility bills and add it to the rent. If a tenant tells the landlord that the smoke alarm is broken, the landlord has 72 hours to replace it. Often have we seen a fire on the news and they said something about the smoke, the smoke detectors weren't working properly. Now, the most important document in a landlord and tenant relationship is the lease agreement. I've seen some lease agreements as long as 27 pages. I've seen some of them as short as one page. A 27 page lease takes a little time to read, <laughs> but you probably should do it because there may be something in the lease that you need to discuss that you didn't know about. Oftentimes when, 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 when people are anxious to move into a unit, they just sign and then they read it later or they glance over it, but they don't read it completely. So what is a lease? A lease is an agreement between a landlord and a tenant that a tenant can occupy and use a property for a certain amount of time in exchange for rent. Be sure to fully understand and agree with its terms before signing. Leases can be oral, although they're very difficult to enforce when they are oral. An oral agreement is technically month to month. An oral lease must have less than a three-year term. If it is more, the lease must be in writing or there is no agreement. The lease must be written in plain language. That is also important. Sometimes landlords will, will pull their leases off of the internet. Sometimes they may have an attorney put the lease together. If the lease is not in plain language, the, the courts in, in many cases will, will err on the side of the tenant in those situations, particularly if there are some ambiguous terms. Now, the hey. most important... Okay, sorry. I was just going to say that it's really important that you know you if you don't if you don't understand the lease, like ask questions. Okay, what can a lease contain? The lease term. What date is the tenant allowed to live there? When is move in? Leases always have to have a, a start date and an end date. Sometimes you may move in a little early, and the landlord may not charge you for moving in early. For instance, you, you, your, your lease starts on the first of the month, but you moved in a couple of days before. If you move in two weeks before, they may prorate the rent and start the lease on the first of that month. Repairs, who makes them? Smoke alarms, who is responsible to check smoke alarms? Visitors, can other people stay for an extended amount of time? Now that's very, that's very um, tricky. Entering, must the landlord provide the tenant notice before entering the property? Utilities, who pays for which utilities? Late charges, are there any late charges? Who, who's responsible for snow, for leaves, for trash? All of those are very, very important. Um, repairs, who makes the repairs? Usually the landlord, unless the tenant caused it. Smoke alarms, the landlord's responsible for placing the smoke alarms in the unit if they are battery operated smoke alarms and you start hearing chirping, you got to load, notify the landlord that the smoke alarms appear to be, um, to have weak batteries. Visitors, can other people stay for an extended amount of time? That's something that you have to discuss with your landlord. Courts don't like to deal with issues involving uh, guests who, 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 who stay as if they live there. Utilities, who pays for which utilities? I've seen, the gas bill and the light bill charged to the tenant, but the landlord pays the water bill. I've seen the landlord not, uh, not pay any utility bills and put, and put them all on the tenant. Those are in the lease, they are in writing. Late charges, late charges are very important too. I've seen late charges as, as little as $15 or as much as $235. That can be a little high and the landlord may have to justify as to why they're late fee is that much. Some of them may even charge 10%. So if you're living in a unit that's $2,200 a month, your late fee would be $220. And who's responsible for snow, for leaves, and for trash. Now, in some leases, there's the waiver of the notice to quit clause. Now, notice to quit is very important too, because before a landlord can bring you to court, they have to post your door or hand it to you. It's called a notice to quit or a notice to vacate. 
if it's if it involves drugs or back rent, they only have to give you a 10 day notice. If it's a breach of a lease condition, uh, you're, you're playing your noise too loud. 15 day notice. If you are not renewing the lease at all, it's a 30 day notice. Now, if the leaf, if your lease waives notice to quit, then the landlord does not have to post your door at all. And that's something you should know because you read the lease. That's not something that you should be finding out later. You could you could say you could come into court and say to the judge, I never received notice. But if the lease has this notice to quit, which means that the waiver of the notice to quit, it means that you have agreed to waive the notice. So it's very important. Now, resolving issues outside of the court. It has often been said that coming to court is next to death. And we, and we talked about what happens when you come to court. The whole world knows about it. Once that case is filed, you may even be getting calls from attorneys to represent you because they have access to that information too. And they're crying, trying to increase their business. So if you're getting calls from attorneys because they know that you've been sued or that you are suing someone, um, then the rest of the world knows too. So when any problem arises, the tenant should send a written notice to the landlord. If the landlord does not respond or does nothing, the tenant should send a second notice. That's very good advice. Your security deposit, a landlord has 30 days to return it. And if any money is deducted, from the, the, deducted the landlord must utilize deductions or the tenant can sue for twice the amount. Now, when we move out, oftentimes there are tenants that do not ask for a walkthrough from the landlord. Walkthroughs are very important. When you move in, I would take pictures to show the condition of a unit before you moved in. I would, I would take pictures to show the condition of the unit when you moved out, just in case they are trying to charge you for damages or for something going on in the unit that may have already been there. But if you do a walkthrough with your landlord, you can point out certain things that may be, result in you getting more back from your security deposit because you actually did a walkthrough with the landlord. Sometimes uh, the landlord may ask you to do a little more cleaning or something like that. If you do a walkthrough, you may have time in order to do that in order to get your um, all of your security deposit back. It's important to, 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 to take pictures. Um, also call 311 to file a complaint with the Department of Permits, Licenses and Inspections. When repairs aren't done, uh, a health and housing code inspection will be sent. So in other words, if you are in a unit and there is sewer backup in your basement, you let your landlord know. If they don't fix it in a reasonable amount of time, you can call one of the health department or you can call the city uh, department of permits and licenses. It may be different in different boroughs, uh, but each, each city, each borough has a place where you can call. Also, if, if, it's, if, it's, if you have to make the repair yourself, let's suppose it's a weekend and you can't get anybody to come out, but you can't, you can't live under those circumstances and you, you make the repairs, you can deduct the cost from your rent. It cannot exceed the monthly rent amount, however, and keep receipts and estimates and inform the landlord of this action. So this is what happens if you can't reach an agreement. <laughs> exactly. All right, the eviction process. I mentioned earlier that courts frown upon self-help. If the landlord wants to evict the tenant, the landlord must take the tenant to court get a court order allowing the tenant to be, to be evicted. But it doesn't happen overnight. You know, once they post your door with the notice to vacate, assuming that you, you, you did not waive that right in your lease, they have seven to 10 days with um, 10 days after they, if it's a 10 day notice to quit because it's, it's back rent or for um, um, drugs, they cannot file the case before that 10 days is up. If it's a 15 day notice for a breach of a lease condition or a 30 day notice because you're not renewing the lease, they cannot file the case before that 30 days is up. So once that happens, 
and they sue you in court, it's going to be a court like this one. Every jurisdiction, every jurisdiction has a municipal court. I happen to be in the city of Pittsburgh, where you all are located. I'm sure there's one close to you. Uh, if there is a landlord and tenant case filed on behalf of your landlord, or if you are suing your landlord yourself, it will be in your local court. It will be in your local court. Now, landlords may not evict the tenant without going to court. Again, we talked about that as being self-help. Landlord may not change the locks, turn off the utilities, or remove the door to get a tenant to move. Now, I had a case, I remember a couple of years ago, where, where the landlord took the door completely off the unit. The tenants found the door in the basement and put it back on. Now, that was pretty egregious, and that was a pretty, pretty bad thing that that landlord did. But apparently, whatever the relationship was between the landlord and the tenant, it got pretty contentious. So what is an eviction? A landlord can decide to evict the tenant for three reasons. The lease term has ended. Oftentimes, leases are one year. And when they end, if the landlord continues to allow you to stay there, if there is no automatic renewal clause in the lease, it becomes a month-to-month -month tenancy. The tenant has violated conditions in the lease. The tenant has failed to pay rent. There are two things that we consider material breaches of a, of a, of a um, lease contract. One is drugs and one is uh, non-payment of rent. Violating a lease condition can be, um, you're not allowed pets in your unit, but you brought a dog in or you brought a cat in. Um, you're making too much noise. You play your stereo too loud at night. The tenant downstairs um, work, works in the, in the morning and you're up at, you're up at night playing your, playing your music very loud. The tenant will receive a copy of the complaint in the mail and instructions to answer it. That may or may not happen depending on the landlord. A tenant can file a counterclaim up to five days before the hearing. So if the landlord is suing you and you have a cause of action that you want the court to hear, um, where you are suing the landlord, you can piggyback on the landlord's complaint without paying the full filing expense and the judge will hear both matters. This means and that the tenant wants to sue the landlord at the same hearing for any expenses such as back rent. And it is expensive to file a complaint in Pennsylvania. Um, there is a procedure if you don't have the funds, it's called Informa Pauperis. You could petition the court to, to uh, that you don't have the funds to file a complaint, but it is not, you know, an inexpensive proposition to file a complaint in Pennsylvania. That's true. All right, going to court. Let's suppose we get to that point. How does a civil lawsuit work? You got a plaintiff and you got a defendant. And in our courtroom, the plaintiff sits on the left and the defendant sits on the right. It determines whether the defendant is liable for injury or harm done to the plaintiff. Um, plaintiff must have preponderance of the evidence and there is no right to an attorney, although many people are represented uh, when a civil action is filed. How a case gets to court. The landlord and tenant receives a violation of the lease agreement or, la or a violation of the landlord and tenant law. The landlord or tenant files a complaint with the magisterial district court. And remember, this is after your door has already been posted. Whether it's the 10 day, 15 day, or 30 day notice. There are fees involved with filing a case. If the landlord prevails, they also will be awarded the court fees that they paid to have the hearing. They are entitled to that back. Now, there are websites that are, that, that where you can get the forms. Forms are available at the district courts or online and the website is, is um, www.pacourts.us backslash forms backslash for hyphen the hyphen the public. The court may have advocates, interviewers to assist in completing the necessary forms, but this is not legal advice. Um, every complaint must include your name and address, amount for which you are suing, a short statement explaining why you are suing. 
So this is important. It's important to note that you know sometimes complaints are a little they're they're legal, they're a little complicated, they're intimidating, but a form helps you. So it, it literally the form will help you say you know explain who who you're suing, uh, what the issue is, what what remedy you are seeking, and often in the in the judge's office, there may be a clerk or somebody who can assist you with completing the complaint, filling out the form. But again, the judge cannot help you fill out that form, right? The judge is an, is a, is, has to be fair and impartial, cannot favor one side over the other. But, you know, there may be a clerk who could, or, or, or some type of advocate in the courtroom or in the clerk's office who could assist you in, in filling out the information for the complaint. Yes, remember the judge is a neutral and detached party. If a judge gets involved in helping you fill out the complaint, then they become a part of your case. Right. And that would be a considered possibly ex parte communication. And even a judge may, may, may put themselves in a position where um, they could get in trouble for that. But knowing who to sue is also important too. You know, if you have a landlord, but that landlord's uh, building is under a corporate name, and you sue the property manager and you list their name on the complaint rather than the corporate entity um, um, who's on your lease, that would be improper. And that would come out in court that you have actually sued the wrong person. And it's very important to name the correct party because that person is going to show up for court. They may even hire a lawyer to just say, your honor, I should not even be on this complaint. They've sued the wrong party. And they paid a lawyer to come to court just to say that. So whenever you are filing a lawsuit, you have to make sure that you have the parties correct and that the spellings are correct. All right, what a landlord should bring to file a case. The written lease. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a landlord come to court without the lease. And before I even ask any question, I just look and see what everybody brought with them. If they bring in a big box, I said, okay, here we go. They brought everything. They brought the lease and the entire file. Housing inspection license, if operating a multi-unit building. A copy of the notice to quit, unless the lease waives this notice. I'm one judge that asked for a copy of the notice to quit. Now the rules do not require that you provide proof of the notice to quit. However, I tell them common sense would tell you that if you take a picture or if you at least bring a copy of what you posted, then, then that would be proof enough and, unless they change the rule and will require some sort of service to prove that they um, posted the door first. I, re, I, I dismissed the case this week because of the notice to quit. The landlord posted the door on March the 29th and they filed the case on April the 5th. That's not even a 10 day notice. Um, I couldn't save the case. I says, you're going to lose your court costs. You have to file this case all over again. Now, this is the landlord. And, and, and I've had several conversations with this person before um, trying to explain the procedures with them. And they, were, they came in under the 10 days. So that case got dismissed, but I'm sure it, it will be back. Unpaid utility bills if the lease requires the tenant to pay them. Photographs of alleged damages. Proof of payment, invoices, and estimates, communications between parties about any damages, and when in doubt, of course, bring everything with you. What should a tenant bring to file a case? If the tenant is suing for repairs, habitability, and running water, they should bring a copy of the written lease, pictures of the conditions, Notices to the landlord of the conditions. If you've sent text messages to the landlord, preserve them in your telephone because that is a memorialization. That is written proof that you've had some communication. If you are suing for your security deposit, have a copy of the written lease. Documentation that the keys were returned and a forwarding address was provided. Oftentimes, I've seen tenants just leave. And sometimes they still have the keys on them. The landlord is going to sue for the next month's rent because they never turned in the keys. And documents from the tenant to the landlord demanding the return of the security deposit. Again, when in doubt, bring everything with you. So 
I have had some judges say, I don't want to see the text on your phone, though. Print it out and hand it, you know, bring it with you. So, you know, the court doesn't necessarily want to say, okay, here's my phone. This shows our, our, our chain of communication. Print it out before you come to court. That is such good advice. Also, photographs in your phone. Right. Print those out, too. You know, I sit in traffic. I sit in eight courts in, in, in downtown Pittsburgh. Traffic court is one of them. Some people come in with such great pictures. They took the time to blow them up. They're on eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. I can see where the no parking sign was located. I can see where their vehicle was. It's so convenient to just whip out your phone and not take that next step to have something printed out. Okay, what happens next after the complaint is filed? The plaintiff must then be served. The plaintiff must then serve the complaint on the defendant. Now, in a landlord and tenant or a civil case, uh, we have deputy constables to do that. Service can be made by certified mail. And we don't get the green card anymore. It's all done by computer. We, we have assigned uh, certified mail right in our system that we can print up and put in a folder. If on a landlord and tenant case, our deputy constables serve them personally. The plaintiff does not serve the defendant or service a defective, then the case will be dismissed. So in a landlord tenant matter, the, the plaintiff doesn't have to serve the, the tenant. The court will have the tenant served. The court will set a hearing date. Landlord tenant cases, once they are filed, they have to be scheduled within seven to 10 days. If the defendant does not show up, the court may enter a judgment against the absent party. If the plaintiff does not show up, the court may dismiss the case. Defendants can file a continuance to move the trial date back, and the court may grant such continuances if justice so requires. Usually, they have to be in writing unless there is an emergency situation. Because remember, and also they should be in a timely fashion. If you call the day before to ask for a for postponement, how are we going to notify the other side to not come? They may have taken off a day off of work. They may have hired their attorney. Uh, the last thing they want to do is be sitting in my waiting room and discover that the case had been moved and they were never notified in a timely fashion. Defendants can file a continuance to move the trial date back and the court may grant such continuances if justice requires. Uh, these motions must be made in writing, writing and filed at least 10 days before the hearing. Oh, I wish I could get all those requests 10 days before the hearing. <laughs> Plenty of time to notify everyone. And, and the mail, if you, if you notify them in the mail, the mail takes longer now than you used to also. <laughs> yes. Okay. Who's involved in this landlord and tenant matter? Judges? Our rulings are, are binding, but may be appealed. Um, I get appealed all the time. You know, I get appealed even when I thought I had a good decision. <laughs> That's a person's right. In a landlord tenant action, they have 10 days to take an appeal. That's the they can appeal the part where you, you can be evicted from your unit and they have 30 days to appeal the money. Court staff. I have one and a half staff people. They can direct people where to go and enforce court etiquette rules. Um, recently I had a young lady, she was uh, she was in high school. The last time she was in court, she wore these shorts and her knees were just blown out completely. And but it was it was a very sensitive case. So I heard the case anyway, but I asked her the next time we come back to court, because it was a continuance case. It was a uh, actually a truancy matter. Could she not uh, wear those shorts? And the next time we came back to court, which was uh, this week. And I know I saw my note indicating how she was dressed from the time before. I would I did not remember it until I saw my note. And the first thing I did is, is, is look to see how she, how she was dressed. Um, lawyers, uh, they provide access to the judicial system. Now, I don't see landlord and tenant matters represented by an attorney often, but I but I do see them see them enough. The neighborhood legal services may represent indigent uh, clients in matters involving landlord and tenant actions. Pro se parties, that's when people represent themselves without a lawyer. Uh, you can do that, but it goes a lot smoother if you are represented. 
but lawyers can be expensive. Uh, they may be able to request to record the proceeding. Security can remove unruly individuals from the courtroom. The courtroom is a public area, however, and all people are allowed to observe judicial proceedings. All parties should treat each other with respect and with courtesy. Uh, magisterial district courts are not like the courts that you see on TV. Uh, they're very large courtrooms with, with, with all the wood and the... Uh, I, have a, I have a nice setup here. My office was downtown probably for almost 50 years. And I moved it back to the community five years ago where it all started. But um, some of our offices are not very big. So they, they can't hold a lot of people. So if someone is turned down, it may be because there's just not enough space, particularly if it's a um, um, highly publicized case. The other thing that's interesting about, you know, hearings before MDJs is that there's not a court reporter, right? There, so there's not a record. So, uh, so if somebody really wants to make a record, they should, they should bring a court reporter or, or ask the court to have a court reporter. Exactly, exactly. And, and we're in a cell phone age, and it's, it would be illegal to record any, any proceeding. And that's actually really important because you can't take pictures in the court. You can't take pictures of a court proceeding. You cannot record a judge. I mean, it is Pennsylvania law that there are no recordings permitted in the courtroom. Okay, what happens once you get to court? Make sure you bring all documents and witnesses. Judge will explain the procedures. A party filing a complaint presents the case first. Don't just start talking. Wait, wait till it's your turn. Sometimes you may not agree with what the other side is saying, and you're just itching to get your point out there. If you are calm, if you are relaxed, that tells that that lets the judge know something about you. If you constantly interrupt the other side, that may make it a difficult day for you. Um, after all the facts are presented and the judge asks all their questions, the judge may decide a matter at the conclusion of the hearing. Uh, 90. 7% of my cases, I make a decision right there. There is a small percentage of, 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 of decisions that I wait and I, and I send it out. Um, the opposing, the, the party who's being sued, they will get their opportunity to testify as well and to present their witnesses and also present their evidence. And you need to be prepared for trial. If the judge gives you a trial date, you need to reach out to your witnesses and have them know that they need to be at the courthouse on that date. The judge is not going to say, okay, I'll have part of the trial today and part of it on another day. The, and unless you file some kind of motion ahead of time and inform the judge that you are having difficulty you know, with the witness and their schedule that maybe the witness can't take off, but it is really important that you are prepared for the trial. That is so important, particularly when you are not represented. I've seen people come very much prepared without an attorney and present their case as if they had a law degree. Um, but you can't wait until the day before to try to gather your evidence and get your witnesses. Oftentimes, you're going to come to court not prepared. And usually, in many situations, the one who is most prepared is the one that will prevail. Obtaining a state of eviction. So let's suppose you, 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 you go to court and you lose. If a judge has granted a landlord an order for possession, a tenant must file a notice of appeal within 10 days to pause an eviction. Once a notice of appeal has been filed, that stops everything. And it is a trial brand new in, a, in another proceeding. The Department of Court Records will, will, will reschedule the case down there. It's not with the same judge. It's, 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 it's with a... a under another judge, and it starts all over again. They don't take any evidence from the previous proceeding. So if you were not prepared at the magisterial district judge level, at least you'll know what preparation you, 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 you need for the appeal. If the tenant does this, they, may, they must pay monthly rent into an escrow account. So in other words, if your rent's $500 a month and you lose at this level, that court may require you to pay up to three months back rent or the judgment amount, whichever is less. Now, if a, a tenant cannot afford it, they may qualify for an informal pauperous waiver. This waiver allows a tenant to pay only one third of the monthly rent into an escrow account. The other two thirds will be made payable within 20 days.
appealing a decision. If a landlord or tenant wants to appeal a decision, they must first file a complaint with the housing court. If an order for possession was issued, an appeal must be filed within 10 days. If money judgment is issued, an appeal must be filed within 30 days. The housing court help desk is tasked with assisting litigants involved in landlord tenant appeals from magisterial district judges' decisions in cases involving residential property and is located at the Department of Court Records. Now we did talk about residential property. Uh, also, there are commercial leases as well. And uh, we didn't spend a lot of time on that, but the procedure is still the same as in residential, except in a commercial lease, the appeal process is, uh, is, is a little bit different. In the city of Pittsburgh, it's the first floor of the city county building, 414 Grand Street. And the phone number is 412-350-4462. And the help desk is terrific. Again, you know, you can reach out to the help desk and there are a lot of other resources available for information about, you know, landlord tenant representation, filing of, of complaints, getting, you know, getting assistance. So, you, you know, these are a few of the websites. I think the next, the next slide also lists websites. Your Honor, I had a question to ask you. Yeah. Um, you know, when you have a, a, a you have a, a hearing first about after the complaint is filed, how long does that hearing typically last? The last one I had yesterday was about an hour and 45 minutes. Now, it was a high-end apartment complex and there was a there was a suit and a counterclaim. And I actually, since it was a dispute about rent. I had to go back, start it when the tenant had a zero balance and look at every payment and go through each and every month up, up until the current time. But the average landlord and tenant complaint probably will last about 10 minutes, maybe 15. Right. And then after the hearing, you know, you set out, you set a date for a trial and how, how long typically is a trial, if it gets to that point, how long typically is a trial of a landlord tenant mm -hmm. A landlord tenant trial could take up to 30 minutes, uh, somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes, depending on the involvement, particularly if, um, if you are not in agreement with what the landlord is saying. One thing that I found is that tenants oftentimes do not ask for uh, receipts right. for their rent. So, and they don't have, they, they don't have uh, copies of any correspondences that they may have had with their landlord. So receipts are very important and they should, there should be a record of, of your rental payments. That makes it a whole lot easier in court. Right. So I don't know if any, I thank you, Your Honor, very much. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I have, don't see any in the chat. Um, Does Katie have any in, in, in person? Okay, well, okay, we did get, we went through this and we had three minutes to spare. I know. <laughs> it was oh, great wow. timing. Thank you. You've well, clearly done good. this before. <laughs> that's good. You know, it seemed, it, it, went, it went pretty smoothly, I think. Yeah. So I want to thank everybody for attending and joining us. 